the Apple App Store. Tens of thousands of various applications, from games to utilities, to those weird completely pointless ones like the lighter app or the one where it looked like you were drinking a beer whenever you tilted the phone. And in the words of any middle-aged tech enthusiast, there is an app. For everything. Well, back in the ancient year of 2012, the App Store was truly thriving. Classics like Draw Something, Instagram, and Angry Bird Space, which was just like the original Funny Bird game, but in space. Here is Pig. Not to mention the classic other gems that were released years prior. So with the App Store relatively new and booming, it was only a matter of time before keen developers were trying to get their piece of the apple pie and become the next big thing. Well, somewhere in England, English game designer Peter Molyneux was going to take his piece of the pie and he was going to eat the shit out of it. Now some background context on Peter as he's a pretty integral piece to all of this, the real star of the story. It was the 1980s and Peter was out selling floppy disks loaded with games for the Atari. And after enough selling here and there, he quickly discovered it was the games on the disks that was making them sell and not the disks themselves. So realising the potential of selling video games in the early 80s, Peter went ahead and made his very own game, The Entrepreneur a text-based simulation game about running a business, a commentary on large video game companies at the time. Well, Peter was ready. He manually duplicated hundreds of copies onto tapes and advertised the game through a free ad slot in a gaming magazine. He was certain the game was going to take off. In fact, he was so certain, he thought his letterbox would be too small for all the envelopes from avid customers. So he quite literally cut a larger letterbox into his door. So with his stock ready, his advertisement public, and his letterbox enlarged, he waited and waited. Finally, the sales figures rolled in. A whopping two copies. One of which was from his own mother. Yeah, it was a total flop. So Peter did the reasonable thing and went from game designing to selling baked beans in the Middle East with his buddy Les Edgar under the company name Taurus Impex Limited. Now this name is important because believe it or not, Commodore International, you know those guys that made computers back in the day, Commodore 64, mistook Peter's company, Taurus, for a much larger networking company at the time. Taurus. So during a shipping, unbeknownst to them, Commodore had reached out to Peter and offered to give him 10 free Amiga systems to help port his networking software. Now Peter had two options here. He could be honest and come clean. Hey guys, uh, I think you've made a mistake. We're Taurus, not Taurus. But then he wouldn't have any free PCs. So of course, he accepted all 10 Amiga systems, sacked the baked beans off, and produced a networking software for the Amiga. And even after coming clean to Commodore, they released the software to moderate success. Now it was the money from this that allowed Peter and Les to start Bullfrog Productions in 1987. And things really took off. After porting Druid 2 Enlightenment to the Amiga, their first real release was Populous, that went on to sell over 4 million copies in 1989. Populous, you must see it. It is the greatest game I have ever seen. They also made Populous 2, Theme Park, Magic Carpet, Magic Carpet 2, and Dungeon Keeper. Bullfrog Studios was then acquired by EA in 1995, and after a night of drinking with friends, Peter left Bullfrog and founded Lionhead Studios in 1996. They went on to produce, oh I don't know, the entire Fable series. They were then acquired by Big Boy Microsoft, and after the release of Fable The Journey in 2012, Peter left Lionhead to start work at 22 Cans. And it's here that it all went a little bit wrong. So, we're back up to date. It's 2012, the App Store is ripe and ready for the taking, and Peter, with his skills in game design and Middle Eastern bean transport under his belt, has a concept for an app. Something big, a game of sorts, a social experiment, played by millions all at once, contributing to one end goal. Well, Peter came up with the idea of a cube. A giant cube made up of billions of tiny cubelets. The idea being that players would slowly chip away at the cube simultaneously over time to remove layers. Well, this idea would go on to become 22 Can's first game, an app named Curiosity. But to remove confusion with the Curiosity rover that had landed on Mars a few months prior, the name was extended. Curiosity, what's inside the cube? And that's what would really matter. The goal? What was in the centre of the cube? Peter promised that what lay at the heart of the cube was life-changingly amazing by any definition. So with the concept fully realised and people excited for this mysterious app's release, Curiosity swiftly entered development and was submitted to Apple on the 28th of September 2012 for a planned release of just a few months later on November 7th at 12.22am. Or at least... 
That was the plan. Unknown to 22 cans, Apple released the game a day early on November 6th. So Peter, who was at a conference in Israel at the time, frantically flew back to the UK and got the Android version out the same night. Well, within three hours, Curiosity had over 100,000 downloads, putting major strain on 22 can servers, leaving thousands of avid players unable to even get in to access the cube on the opening night. Oh my god, no way, no, no, no. Which quickly led to the app being review bombed down to one star on the App Store. Not the most ideal release. But thankfully, by the morning of the 7th, the initial intended release date, things had somewhat improved. A maximum of 32,000 players could access one server at a time to reduce load. So finally, the ominous black cube was unleashed to the public. And over the next few months, people got to work, frantically tapping away at their phone screens, millions upon millions of individual cubelets being removed every hour. By November 8th, just one day after the planned release, the first layer of the cube is chipped away, consisting of 100,614,152 individual cubelets. Two days later, on November 10th, layer 2 was gone. By November 25th, 20 days in, 43 layers had been removed. As layer after layer was gradually worked down, the cube slowly started to change and evolve, different colours and images being revealed over time, and strange white text would float around the faces of the cube. After enough time, players became inventive, using the surface of the cube as a canvas of sorts to carve out messages, patterns, or suggestive artwork. Now each cube that you chipped away at would grant you coins that could then be used in an item store of sorts to buy different tools to mine away at the cube faster. Some players even produced manual robots to help mine away at the cube to increase their riches. A small group of diehard players had racked up a coin count upwards of multiple billions, until 22 cans had a major bug that wiped every single user's coin count in a matter of seconds. In fact, in fact, whilst the project had this godlike mysterious aura around it, behind closed doors it was far from plain sailing. The server issues from the opening days had only worsened as more players poured onto the app. Developers were pulling 36 hour marathons to try and improve the back end. They added a PayPal button to the game to help raise funds for server costs, but after raising $900 it was removed as they didn't feel that it fell in line with the approach 22 cans wanted. And to make matters even worse, Peter had fallen ill with food poisoning. But this didn't deter anybody. Curiosity was the perfect formula. It was addictive and easy with a basic concept. When you're bored, you boot up the app, chip away a few cubelets here and there, and then move on with your day. But when you had nearly 3 million players with the app downloaded at its peak, it became something of a big deal in 2012. I mean, I genuinely remember going into school and everyone would be sat tapping away, each player tunnelling to be the first to the centre, to be that one individual to break that last singular cubelet to claim the life-changing prize sealed inside. Well, on the 26th of May 2013, after six months, 2,000 layers, and a suspected 69 billion cubelers, it happened. The cube had finally been completed. Peter announced in a tweet that the experiment had come to an end. One individual had broken the final cubler, and that the winner had been notified. So who was the lucky winner to achieve the feat that no other had? Well, it was 18-year-old Edinburgh resident, Brian Henderson. The alert flashed up within Brian's Curiosity app, congratulating him, along with a 22cans contact email address. Brian had done it. He was the only one to reach the true centre of the cube and receive the life-changing prize at the heart of the entire experiment. What was this miracle gift that Peter had promised? Millions of dollars? A contract of sorts? A business proposition, maybe? While well, people continued to speculate about the contents of the cube, until, later that day, a YouTube video was uploaded to the 22Cans YouTube channel. Well, that was Peter himself, stood inside a bright white cube. He confirmed that the experiment had ended, and finally revealed the prize. He announced that 22Cans were working on a new game titled Goddess. We are making a game called Goddess. A sandbox village building god game where you played as God. And he explained that whoever reached the centre of the cube will be rewarded with the God of Gods role within the game. You, the person who had reached the centre, will be the god of all people that are playing goddess. Along with a percentage of all of goddess's total revenue. Every time people spend money on goddess, you will get a small piece of that pie. Now from what I understand, this God of Gods role was part of the multiplayer mode of Goddess and would allow Brian in this case to control the entire multiplayer experience, with players across the game being able to challenge him like some sort of Dark Souls boss 
Okay, so sure, it was a lot different from what people expected. It wasn't a fat wad of cash or anything. But hey, a percentage of all revenue from a game made by the man responsible for the entire Fable series could be pretty life-changing. And the God of God role is pretty substantial if the game grew and had a large active community. I mean, imagine taking a game that's played by millions and you being the figurehead individual that most people that play the game probably know. Now for Brian, he just casually downloaded the app, broke a few blocks and finished the cube. He was an ordinary 18 year old studying graphic design in Edinburgh and being born in 1994, his childhood games would have been more down the PS1 route, not the Atari. He'd heard of Fable but never played it and besides a video with the Yogg's cast, he had no idea who Peter was. But hopeful of his newly earned prize, Brian hesitantly reached out to 22 cans through the email on his app. Brian typed out a lengthy, thought out email. Did I win? Yes, 22 cans replied, asking Brian for his full name, where he's from, and provided him with a contact phone number. According to an interview with Eurogamer, Brian was pretty casual about the whole thing. I mean, it had come out of nowhere, really. But the idea of a large sum of cash off a huge game was a pretty exciting prospect for an 18-year-old. Brian recalled being swarmed with interviews by media outlets and receiving thousands of new Twitter followers off the back of the news. He received a text from Peter, writing, if God is so successful, you're going to have an amazing year. And a week later, 22 cans had organized for Brian to visit their offices and paid for his flight and travel. So Brian eventually arrived at the 22 Cans HQ and was greeted by Peter himself. Now this was big. This was the day that Brian's life would change forever. He was going to sign a contract that would potentially grant him hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of dollars. Not to mention that God of God's role. Or at least... That's what should have happened. Instead, Brian was placed in front of an early, half-finished, rough model of Goddess with basic functionality and ended up sitting there for three hours straight until it started to get dark. Until he was eventually taken into a side room. Finally, there it was. The contract. What all of this was for. One singular pen stroke and Brian's life would be changed forever. But what exactly was the percentage cut of revenue that Brian would receive? 10%? 15%? 20%? 1%. Brian was legally promised 1% of all revenue from Goddess, and that almighty God of God's role, while the multiplayer mode, hadn't even been developed yet. And thanks to the wording of the contract, nothing actually stated that 22 cans had to deliver on their promises to Brian. Of course, a somewhat deflated Brian signed regardless. I mean, what did he really have to lose? Then to round the night off, 22 cans took him to a local pub, where they apparently had their backs to him the entire night, until staff member Tony bought over some Jägermeister. Peter didn't even turn up to the pub in the end, and caught a flight to a games convention. I mean, that's exactly what you want from a life-changing prize. Three straight hours on a half-produced game, a slither of the revenue, and a Jäger bomb from a middle-aged game. Game developer. It wasn't all doom and gloom though, because Brian was sent home with a signed poster and a t-shirt. Yeah, that's crazy. After his visit to their offices, Brian would repeatedly email the 22 Cans team, just to try and get some sort of idea on what was happening. Weeks turned into months, and after a year of regular emails, Brian lost hope. Goddess had launched on Steam Early Access by this point, and they'd even announced Hub World, the multiplayer feature of the game that would theoretically implement Brian's God of Gods role. Brian did eventually receive an email from 22 Cans financial chief, Peter Murphy. Not to be confused with Peter Molyneux. Who knows, maybe everyone at 22 Cans is called Peter. The email simply said they'd get in touch, but to this day, nothing. Brian hasn't received anything. Not a penny from Goddess, no God of Gods role, no contact with 22 Cans. Although, after the mess of the whole situation, Brian didn't really seem to care too much. So in the end, Curiosity's prize, to put it lightly, was shit. Eurogamer did eventually reach out to Peter about the whole situation, and if it wasn't already obvious enough from the Steam reviews, he revealed that the state of 22 cans was dire, with the mobile version of the game only just bringing in enough cash to keep the company afloat, as well as numerous layoffs only making things worse. They say that Curiosity killed the cat, well, it seems also killed an iOS game development studio. 22 Cans also released a second game, Goddess Wars, for some reason, in the middle of development for Goddess, that of course didn't perform any better. Curiosity was a tale of something unique and exciting. The concept was really clever, especially back then. What does this say here? Oh. <laughs> So, and it'll always be an interesting memory in the back of my head. But Peter, of course, grossly overpromised on the prize, and it all fell apart. Peter has kind of made a name for himself in the gaming industry when it comes to false promises at this point, saying certain features will be in his games. Polishing those features much, much more than we've polished anything before. The greatest role-playing game of all time. Getting fans excited to build hype, then the game's releasing with said features seemingly missing. And I found a glitch in the game where you can move, but your main guy just stands still. Polishing those features. Now, whether this is deliberate or naivety and unachievable expectations on Peter's part, 
who knows. But Curiosity was the perfect example of this. Peter had promised a life-changing prize for the game, in a haze to try and raise hype for the Black Mirror-esque social experiment, and poor Brian was caught up in the middle of it all. And as for Brian, I can only assume he's living a relatively normal life. 22 cans have seemingly given up on Goddess and released a game called The Trail on the App Store in 2016. And as for Peter, well, actually, what is Peter doing? Ah, he's working on an NFT game. Of course he is. Well, I guess we'll see where that one goes, eh? And with all of that said, goodbye.